My cat has finally calmed down. Hopefully we'll be chill for the rest of the evening. <laughs> we'll give it a couple of minutes for people to sign in, say hello, and we'll get the show on the road. <clears throat> we'll dance while we do it. <laughs> I I received a second copy of Adiba's book because of course I'm her biggest fan, so I already had it. <laughs> and I wanted to encourage attendance by offering to give away the copy. So I just made like a quick Google form. So within what do you think, like the last five minutes or 10 minutes or so, I can just post it in the chat and that way whoever's still here, I'll mention it sometime early on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Oh, I see a lot of people that, you know, hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, Pri, do you want to share how your launch day has been, what you've been up to, what you've done to celebrate? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so I launch day has been quiet, but exciting at the same time. And I appreciate everyone who's here. Um, I have just felt really, really loved. Um, I have my first physical event tomorrow, so <laughs> that's when things get really hectic, but I still felt really loved. I posted a random midnight tweet that kind of popped off and I <laughs> got a lot of responses under it that I got too overwhelmed to even respond to, but uh, I still um, could feel that, that a love from everyone and uh, it meant a lot. Um, so launch day has been going really well. I spent the morning calling. Um, the indies are great. <laughs> My local indies have it, but I spent the morning calling some BNNs and they are not as great. So they did not have it. Um, or if they did have it, they sold out of it, which I guess is a good thing. Um, uh, and then I ordered some takeout. My friend is actually flying in. Her plane got delayed. Um, so she is coming during the event and is unfortunately going to miss it. But, but yeah, I feel very loved today. <laughs> I'm glad you deserve to feel loved. It's been a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I got the flowers from you and Tommy and I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Which also the flowers also have like a really funny story. <laughs> yeah. So when did I get those? A couple weeks ago? <laughs> yeah. Like the. 3rd of December, right? Oh, yes, you're yeah. right. So instead of the 3rd of January, the flowers that Adiba and our other friends sent me got delivered on the 3rd of December. And so I was surprised when all of a sudden I, I am getting the doorbell and have the flowers there. And I sent them a message saying, oh, wow, thank you so much for these. And they were both <laughs> shocked that it had come so early. So then uh, the flower delivery man came back and said, these weren't meant to to go out until January 3rd but he let me keep the chocolate so now I have twice as many chocolates from <laughs> you both <laughs> well I will kick us off for the evening um I we've got a good group of people who are in here so hello and welcome everyone my name is Lainey Rose and I'm the events coordinator here at East City Bookshop a woman-owned community-focused indie bookstore located just a few blocks away from the U.S. Capitol building we are so excited to be with you all tonight and before we get started we have just a couple of housekeeping things we will have time for questions at the end so if you have a question that you'd like to ask please put that in the q a box so that we can easily see them we would love for you to keep your chat box for your general enthusiasm so tell us where you're tuning in from and what your favorite romance is also if you have any technical technical difficulties please let us know in the chat my colleague emma is monitoring that and can help if necessary and if you need to purchase a copy of The Love Match or any of Adiba's books, you can shop on our website and we do ship anywhere. And the reason we're here tonight, I was immediately sold on this book because like so many romance lovers, the hand flex in the 2005 adaptation of Pride and Prejudice lives in my head rent free. So I will snatch up any and every book that gives a nod to the classic. 
pitched as to all the boys I loved before meets Pride and Preju Prejudice. The love match is a delightful and heartful rom-com about a Bangladeshi American teen whose meddling mother arranges a match to secure their family's financial security just as she's falling in love with someone else. Our booksellers have already been buzzing about this book, and I am so excited that it is out in the world for everyone to read. Our author of the evening is Priyanka Taslim, a Bangladeshi American writer, teacher, and lifelong New Jersey resident. Having grown up in a bustling Bangladeshi diaspora community, surrounded by her mother's entire clan and many aunties of no relation, her writing often features families, communities, and all the drama therein. Currently, Priyanka teaches English by day and tells all kinds of stories about Bangladeshi characters by night. Her writing usually stars spunky Bangladeshi heroines finding their place in the world and a little swoony romance too. And joining us in conversation tonight is Adipa Jagardar, the award-winning, critically acclaimed, and best-selling author of The Henna Wars, Hani and Issues Guide to Fake Dating, and A Million to One. A Bangladeshi Irish writer and former teacher, she has an MA in post-colonial studies from the University of Kent, England, and a BA in English and History from UCD, Ireland. She is the winner of the YA Book Prize 2022, the KPMG Children's Books Ireland's Awards 2021, and was a finalist for the 2022 Lambda Literary Awards. All her writing is aided by tea and a healthy dose of Janelle Monet and Haley Kyoko. I will let these two lovely folks take it away for the evening, and I will come back a little bit later, but for now... Thanks so much. <clears throat> um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And first of all, like a huge congrats to you, Priyanka, because I know it's been a long journey um, and we're finally here to the release of The Love Match. Um, so obviously the two of us have known each other for quite a while. We actually met, for anybody who doesn't know, we met in 2017. Um, and at the time we we're both actually working on very different books. Um, I remember you're writing like an adult fantasy um, and I was writing like adult women's fiction. So we've both come a long way. Um, so do you wanna maybe share a little bit about your journey from then when you're writing something very different to now when you've just published The Love Match? Uh, absolutely. So it's kind of a funny story that The Love Match released from Salam Reads um, because one of the things that motivated me to finally start writing seriously again was uh, when the Salam Reads imprint was first announced. Um, and so in college was the first time that I really started writing Bangladeshi characters, but somewhere in the back of my mind, there was always a voice saying, there's no way someone like you can get published writing the kinds of stories that you want to write. Um, right now, publishing only wants to see uh, stories of trauma from uh, Muslim authors, from South Asian authors, from authors of color in general, and that's not what you want to write. Uh, but when the Salam Reads imprint was announced, I think the very first book that they announced for it was by a Bangladeshi American author as well. And that switched the light off in my head. And I know we both talked about Karuna Riazi's The Gauntlet before, but that switched the light bulb above my head and made me realize that maybe the chance was small, but it, there was still the chance that I could write, uh, write the kinds of books that I wanted to. Um, so I never really intended to, I, I would say like at the time, I didn't think I was going to publish with Slum Reads. And that's the funny coincidence that happened um, that years later that my book would publish with them. Um, but that at that time, I finally started writing the book that you were talking about, the adult uh, fantasy novel. And it took me years at the time. Adiba and I were both querying at the same time. It took me years to get that fantasy um, signed with an agent. Um, and then once we started working together, um, I had just done so many ground up revisions of that book that I was sick of it. Um, I'm not sick of it anymore, but I don't have the time anymore to actually go back and work on it, but I was sick of it and didn't have the capacity at the time to do the revision that my agent was uh, discussing with me. So instead she said, why don't you work on some other books and see what happens? Um, and of course, life happens for everyone involved, right? Um, <clears throat> so at the time, um, she had something personal going on uh, in her life, and I ended up writing um, one other book. And then before that book could go on submission, 
I had just gotten a revision letter for it, but before that go book could go on submission, uh, the pandemic happened and uh, I needed joyful escape at the time. And maybe some, uh, some of our attendees can relate to this, but I am an avid fantasy reader, but I also like romance. And since the pandemic, 90% of what I've been reading has been escapist fluffy romance novels. So that's when the love match kind of came into being. Um, and, and yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> that's so interesting what you said about Salam Reads as well, because I remember, I think one of the triggers for me um, to start writing my books centering like Bangladeshi um, characters was the existence of DV Pet because DV Pet started like around the same time when I started writing my adult women's fiction, which was my first book starring, you know, a Bangladeshi character. Um, so it really says a lot about like how these initiatives, um, like not just in terms of like they succeed, not just in terms of putting people like at the forefront, but they also succeed in terms of allowing people like us to believe that we can be that person sometime in the future. Um, so yeah, it's it's amazing. I think visibility is so important. When people say representation matters, that's a huge aspect of it. Sometimes even as an adult, you don't feel like you can accomplish something if you don't see it happening for anyone else who looks like you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely agree. Um, so something that I really loved about um, Zara as a main character um, is that her experiences felt so real to life. Um, she's juggling so many different responsibilities. Some of them are like real life responsibilities, but a lot of them are also like emotional responsibilities um, for her family, sometimes also for her friends, for herself as well, obviously. Um, but at the same time, she's trying to like find her own happiness while juggling all of these things. Um, why did you decide to write a character like Zara? And what was the process of building her character? So like I mentioned, um, <clears throat> like a lot of readers, I am a huge fan of romance. Um, but oftentimes when I read romance novels growing up, even when they started to feature people who looked a little bit like me, they didn't always delve into some of the other experiences that I had, um, particularly as, um, as a brown girl who grew up in a working class community. And I, as a teacher too, I taught in a working class community that was predominantly black and brown. And I would see my students have to deal with certain experiences. There was a lot of joy in their lives, but they also had a lot of burdens that you don't necessarily see reflected in a lot of young adults, especially in the genre of romance. Um, perhaps you do in issue books, um, which are also important, but you don't necessarily see them in rom-coms. Um, I've often made the joke that a lot of rom-coms are uh, have the biggest conflict being um, someone wants to open their own cupcake shop or something else, which is great, you know, but uh, a lot of people have a uh, bigger concern sometimes, including very young people. So I... Uh, I even had students who would come to class late because uh, they might be the nicest kid, otherwise responsible, want to do their work, want to succeed, but they had to bring their brother and sister to school before they arrived. Um, and as a the oldest daughter in an immigrant family as well, a lot of responsibilities fell to me. Um, I was my parents' champion outside of the house. I had to translate for them. I had to deal with a lot of serious paperwork um, since I was very, very young. And sometimes I also felt like uh, the third parent to my siblings. Uh, so I wanted to write a character like that, that reflected these realities, but still have it be an escapist romance novel, because I feel like those readers, uh, working class readers, black and brown readers who come from that background, anyone at all who uh, doesn't necessarily have a puppies and rainbows sort of life. I wanted them to be able to pick up the book and still get that scenic, um, out, straight out of a movie kind of rom com. Mm -hmm. And I think I think they definitely will be able to find that. Um, something that I always like to say is that all of us are like 
living our lives, both the bad and the good, like at the same time, you know, we don't get to separate our lives by genre. So I think a lot of the times, like even genre fiction should, should take that into account. So yeah, I think, I think that's amazing. I think um, that whole, you know, being the eldest daughter of like an immigrant family, I'm also, I'm also that. Um, that's definitely like very real. And I think a lot of people will be able to, you know, relate to Zara and all of, all of the, all of the things she goes through during the novel. Um, so something else that I really loved about the book was that it has, it's almost entirely made up of South Asian characters. And the majority of them are actually Bangladeshi, um, which is obviously like really rare to see in books. Like it's rare to see even any Bangladeshi characters, let alone a book full of them. Um, so why was it important for you to write a book filled with South Asian and Bangladeshi characters? So I wanted the book to be a love letter to the diaspora community that I grew up in, which has one of the largest Bangladeshi populations in the entire U.S. Um, and one thing was that it was just unrealistic. Um, it was just unrealistic to have many white characters because when I lived in that community, the majority of the white people that I saw on a day-to-day -day basis were my teachers who drove in from miles away sometimes to, to teach in that community. Um, so the first thing was that it was unrealistic, which is an excuse that a lot of people use to have all white cast. So I thought, why not? That's my excuse too. Um, and then the other thing was that I just wanted to try to represent, or at least try to capture uh, even slightly the, the diversity of belonging to a community, how you can belong to a particular community and still have so many different people. So there are a lot of South Asian characters in the book, um, especially Bangladeshi characters, but I would say all of those characters have very different experiences, particularly um, Zara and her best friends. I wanted them to kind of be foils for each other. So Zara has uh, these two Pakistani teen girls as her best friends who um, don't have the same experiences that she does. Uh, I wanted readers outside of the South Asian and Muslim experience to be able to pick up the book and not make the assumption, oh, this happens to everyone. Every brown girl is pressured into an arranged marriage or arranged dating or whatever might be the case. Um, so you have these other girls that are very independent. They basically run the show with their dad. He's He's something of a secret feminist himself. He aspires for them to take over his tea shop one day and, and franchise it and even take over the world someday. So I just wanted to show uh, the diversity of any particular experience because we're not monoliths. Yeah, and I think that definitely, definitely comes through. And I think, again, I think it's especially important because there's such a dearth of like Bangladeshi um, representation, um, especially um, that, you know, I, I've never seen like a TV show with a Bangladeshi character um, who's like at the forefront, you know, we've seen, obviously we've seen the character in How I Met Your Mother, um, who made awful comments about Bangladeshi women, we know that, but um, to have like good Bangladeshi representation characters at the forefront being Bangladeshi, that's still like missing from most media. So it's amazing to have that diversity. Um, and hopefully, you know, people who pick, pick up the book who aren't Bangladeshi, they can kind of sit down and see this is an entire community of people, not just one person and not just one experience. So that's amazing. Um, so again, you know, going back into how you're writing um, Bangladeshi characters. Um, in in your book, um, you specifically wrote not just Bangladeshi characters, but Sileti characters. Um, so can you share what were some of the challenges and rewards of writing this very specific identity into the book? So I'm sure that a lot of less represented South Asians can relate to this. I've heard this um, from a lot of different authors, uh, like the author of Sunny G's uh, shoot, Series of Fresh Decisions. Series of Fresh yeah. Decisions, yes, um, Navdeep Dillon. 
uh, he's also mentioned how he doesn't speak Hindi. And so the majority of South Asian representation tends to be representation that is heavy with Indian representation and specifically uh, Hindi speaking Indian representation, um, and occasionally Urdu. Uh, whereas, so there was not really a lot of books with Bangladeshi words in it. Um, yours were some of the first examples for me to have that representation at all. Um, so when I first started writing, I actually used a lot of common Hindi spellings. I wrote chai, for example, before writing sa. It was a whole. Me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Just using that word, I went from chai to cha to finally deciding. I will go all in and use the Sileti spellings and I wrote it Sa. Um, the reason I aspired to do that is because, and we've talked about this before, um, the two of us, uh, the majority of Bangladeshi diaspora people are actually Sileti. Um, however, we don't really see that represented because Sileti is considered uh, not the standard dialect of Bangladesh. So whenever you do happen to see people speaking Bengali in any sort of media, it is that standard Shuddho Bengali. Um, so it was a journey for me to get to even in my own mind to get from Chai to Sa. Um, and, I, and I did face some challenges with that. Um, I, for example, had a copy editor who called out my spelling of every instance of Bengali and said, this is what it says on Google online. Even though I myself am not Bengali, this is what it says on Google online. This is the standard Bangla spelling. So why did you do this? Uh, so that was very difficult for me. My team handled that very well and I appreciate them for that, um, but it, you know, when you have all these obstacles to get to published in the first place, those sorts of things can be really demoralizing. Um, so it was definitely a journey, but ultimately, whenever I see um, people tag me, readers tag me and say, oh my God, there's Silati Bangla in this, I feel like I've done a service uh, to them. And that to me, it takes priority over possibly some people who speak a different dialect being upset that I didn't use Hindi or that I didn't use the standard Bangla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even for me, I am Sileti, but obviously I don't speak Sileti, um, I, but I do understand it. Um, for me, like your book was the first one that I read where Sileti was used, you know, on the pages. And it was really cool to see um, because it was so familiar to me, even though, you know, I don't speak it because so many of my relatives do speak it. Um, and uh, as I said to you, you know, I gave the book to my sister-in-law to read and she's not from Silet, um, but she, because, you know, she's married to my brother and she's like, she sees my relatives often. She's very exposed to Sileti as a dialect. Um, and she's like, she was reading it and she was having such a good time. And she was like, I love how silly this book is. Like, it's amazing. Um, so I think, you know, even people who are not silly can hopefully learn to appreciate like the fact that you have done this because it is, um, I think it's very groundbreaking that you have done this. I, I do think you're probably like one of the first, if not the first author to be writing, you know, silly right into the pages. Um, so, you know, well done for doing that. Thanks for taking that step. <laughs> Thank you. I think I even Googled once um, Sileti just to see if other books had it. And they mentioned uh, a very famous book. That I'm not going to name right now because, but by a Bangladeshi author. And <laughs> it mentioned how the Sileti characters in the book were written negatively, given a negative portrayal. So that is something that sometimes not. Okay. <laughs> we're not going to count that. But yeah, it's good to get to know. You'll have to tell me yeah. about that later, which book and author that was. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's move on to talking a little bit about romance. So there are so many amazing romance tropes in the love match. Um, one of them is obviously the love triangle between Zara and the two love interests. Um, and the love triangle is still to this day a pretty controversial trope to write. Um, you know, there's obviously been some famous love triangles um, which have made it controversial. Um, which we're not going to talk about today. Um, and it's a really difficult one to pull off, not just because of the controversy, but also because of the controversy. Um, so can you share a little bit about why you decided to write this book as a love triangle and how did you balance writing both of the love interests? Uh, so I definitely knew going into it that writing a love triangle was going to be unpopular. And it's funny because if you look at reviews of the love match, that's one of the thing, the main things that people talk about where 
obviously they're in three camps. They're, I would say it's very rare, which is good. Very rarely are people, uh, are there people who say like, oh, I hated love triangles and I hated this one. So pat on the back for that, the majority of my readers will say something like, I hate love triangles, but I surprisingly really like this one. And that that is the highest possible compliment I could get. Um, the reason that I decided to write this love triangle, particularly between three Bangladeshi characters, is because I don't think there has been a male love interest in YA who is Bangladeshi. Um, and even to this day, it's pretty rare um, to get South Asian romances that have both characters being South Asian, there are great authors who do it, uh, like Nisha Sharma, Barheran, Barnaz Rishi. Um, basically, check my blurb list for of recommendations because the coolest authors blurb me. And many of them do write uh, romances like that, in addition to uh, interracial romances that don't necessarily center white voices. Um, so for me, it was important to have these two boys who are Bangladeshi and very, very different. Once again, to kind of touch on how, how we are not a monolith and how there's many, many different ways to, um, to occupy the same identity. So you have Haroon who starts off at this, as that kind of typical broody love interest and the Mr. Darcy as Dara calls him frequently throughout the story. Um, and eventually she learns that there's more depth to him than she imagined. Uh, and then you have Naeem who I think is honestly pretty revolutionary as far as South Asian representation of boys that we've seen. Um, because whenever you see, at least in Western media, particularly by creators who are not Western, but even sometimes within our own community, there's this um, perpetuated stereotype of the, the funny, funny little nerd brown guy, right? And so Naeem, I wanted him to kind of embody, um, you know, he's this charming musician, this free spirit who kind of tumbles into Patterson and gets the whole community talking about him. And even though he's not suitable, um, all of the aunties are kind of swooning at him, even if they don't intend to. Uh, so I really wanted to write that that charming uh, trope for a brown boy um, in this case. And uh, I've talked about it with you before, but he's somewhat inspired by the character of Beck from uh, Victorious, only because Beck was the first time that I ever saw a cool brown love interest in media. And they never even acknowledged that he was South Asian in any way, but he was the first time. And I remember when I first looked it up, I my, my brown senses were tingling and I thought, this is not a white boy, no matter what they're trying to tell us, I'm gonna look it up. And I found out he was South Asian. Um, that was groundbreaking for me. So Naeem in personality isn't very much like Beck, but he does embody that like cool musician that I don't think we see a lot of uh, represented. Yeah, which is really interesting because I feel like, like specifically in Bangladeshi culture, at least, like music is so important to us. Um, like poetry is so important to us. Literature is so important to us. Like we're a very, um, we're a very like literary artistic culture. Um, so it's interesting that we're never presented that way. Um, and I think part of it comes with like kind of being lumped together um, with other South Asian cultures or stereotypes of other South Asian cultures. Um, but also obviously other South Asian cultures are also not seen as um, nuanced um, by, you know, the Westerners who are often writing them. Definitely. I think that also is where uh, representation of class comes in, because I think a lot of um, non-working class South Asians um, don't necessarily have the opportunity, like their parents never want them to go into careers related to the arts, because uh, they have more of the means to, to get their children to accomplish certain things, and they would rather they choose that safe, secure route. I mean, most parents do, but uh, but them and Kayla. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so obviously we've spoken about the romance, but other than the romance, um, the love match also has a lot of other, you know, brilliant relationships that are highlighted. Um, one of these relationships is between Zara and her mom. Um, I think, you know, the relationship there is so deep and so nuanced. And I really, really appreciated seeing that in a book. 
Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about why you decided to make this such an important aspect of the book and how you navigated writing it? Uh, definitely. I would say, even though I love Harun and Naeem, I think Zara's relationship with her mom is probably the most important relationship in the book. Um, and that's not usually what people expect in a romance, but I think with the amount of importance that South Asians put on community and family, it just made sense um, for me. Um, but I really wanted to represent these two uh, women who, young women and uh, women in Zara's case, who are actually very similar, but don't seem that way to each other at first. And they're constantly butting heads sometimes because they're so similar. Um, they just present it in different ways because Zara grew up in the US and uh, her mom is more traditional. Um, but I, in a lot of representation of Asian characters in general, you tend to see like this tiger mom. And it isn't until recently that we've actually gotten this media through the lens of Asian creators that we've seen that with any medium any sort of nuance. It's often just people assume that this is what our community is and they kind of put out that, that stereotype into the world. Um, and I think, you know, stereotypes happen for a reason sometimes, but uh, that lack of nuance is, is really important to, to navigate. So I really wanted to write Zara's mom as a character who is not a, vil a villain in the story and you you come to learn and Zara comes to learn her reasons for doing what she does but at the same time they're not excused by the narrative and it's also about her mom's journey to uh to come to understand Zara better so that's uh important for both of them to do and I think where her mom is at the beginning of the book she's a recently widowed woman who has put a lot of her identity into being a wife and a mother. Um, that really is part of the reason that she does a lot of what she does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, what you said about like a lot of, there being a lot of stereotypes about, um, you know, the tiger mom in um, Asian representation um, is so true. And I think what I really appreciated about the love match is that I feel like you are constantly kind of speaking back to those stereotypes, not just about the tiger mom, but a lot of other stereotypes as well. Um, and you're kind of breaking them down, not by saying this doesn't exist in our culture, but by saying, yes, it might exist, but here's like the behind the scenes of it. Here's the nuance of it, you know? So I, I really enjoyed that. Um, so finally, what I want to ask is, What's one thing you hope people take away um, from reading The Love Match? Uh, so I've mentioned this before, The Love Match is really written from a place of me never seeing myself represented um, when I was younger. And, uh, and you mentioned how I mentioned, met your mother earlier. I did share uh, a guest essay that I wrote yesterday about the first time I saw how I met your mother. And the first time I ever saw a Bangladeshi character in Western media. Um, and it was only so Barney in How I Met Your Mother, if you know Barney, could make a, a, a sexist and racist joke about how ugly Bangladeshi women are. Um, and I was already a really self-conscious teen at the time. So like a lot of, uh, like a lot of uh, young brown girls and brown people in particular, um, there was a time when I wished, you know, I wish I could have blonde hair. I wish I had green eyes, blue eyes, um, because that's what I was reading about. Those were the girls that were the protagonists uh, in the books that I read. So the love match was really uh, a journey um, to of self-love. And I hope that uh, readers now can have books like the love match and books like you know, Hany and Shu's Guide to Fake Dating or Adiba's newest release that's about to come out in the, U uh, the UK and Ireland, um, A Million to One. Uh, all of these diverse books, I hope that they make readers feel more accepted. Um, <clears throat> and like that can be the love, uh, love interest in a story, that they can be the hero, they can be the heroine, uh, even if their circumstances are not just that they are people of color, uh, but they might have be like Zara struggling financially um, or uh, whatever else may be the case. I wanted readers like my students to be able to pick up a book like The Love Match and feel seen and feel like they can be the main characters. So I hope that's what readers take away from it. 
I honestly, I think that they will. I think they will because, um, again, I think your book is so rare, um, which is sad because, you know, we need more books like yours, but also exciting because you're the person, you know, breaking those barriers. You're the person writing those books. And I think, you know, you're the right person to be doing that. Um, so I definitely think, I think I took a lot, lot away from the love match when I read it. Um, and, you know, I'm not a teenager, um, but I can only imagine what like the teens that are reading the book will take away from it. Um, and I actually lied, I do have one final question before we move on to the audience questions. Um, Cause it's the final question, which I really want to ask, um, which is, do you think Honey and Ishu would get along with Zara, Harun and Naeem? And which one of them do you think would be friends and which one of them would be like not friends maybe? Oh, this is a great question. I love this question. So I'm glad you asked about it. I feel like Honey and Zara would get on like a house on fire. The two of them are like, you know, they both want to be good girls. They both want to be de desperate to be accepted by their friends. Um, and I think they would get along. I feel like Ishu might hate a lot of the characters and not necessarily, I don't think she would hate Zara, but I think she would find Naeem like a little bit too, like, to sunshine get away from me like why why are you being here with all your presence but I think she and Haroon would get along and the two of them would sit in like grumpy silence together um and you know end up being friends in that way just like quietly brooding together while Zara and Hani are friends and Naeem is off wondering why no one wants to be his friend I actually I agree like 100% I think that's exactly how it would be and I actually think what would happen is Zara would actually help Honey kind of like understand like what's going on with her friends and hopefully like learn to stand up for herself like a little bit more so I think Zara would be really good for Honey and I also I can see like Honey and Issue and Zara and whoever she ends up with at the end of the book um, going on like fun double dates together so that would be really cute. Definitely. So um, people in the audience, the time has come to write the crossover fan fiction. You can't tag us in it, but please write the crossover. Yes, fan please fiction. do. Please do. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we can move on to the audience questions. So I already see there's like a bunch of questions there already. Um, but if you have any more questions for Priyanka, please do put them into the question box. Um, okay. So the first question is from Amparo. Um, she asked, hi Amparo, first of all, um, thanks for coming. Um, so she asks, is there a scene in the love match that was either exactly the same from brainstorming to publication or quite similar to the initial version? Okay, so I also have to say, hi Amparo. This house, we love Amparo, so. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, I think there are actually several scenes that have stayed the same. A lot of the ending changed, but in the beginning, there's a lot of scenes that stayed the same. So all of the iterations of the love match started with the wedding. Um, <clears throat> and that has been the case throughout. Um, it was important. If, if you read the uh, the foreword in the story, is it a foreword or is it a prologue? I honestly don't know. But if you read the world according to Bengali Natox in the very beginning of the book, it talks about um, the importance of weddings when it comes to Bengali Natox and Bengali narratives. Uh, so it was really uh, meaningful for me to be able to have that wedding right in the beginning, even if it's not the wedding of an important character, it still kind of works as a framing device for the plot. Uh, so that, that has stayed the same, even if I've tweaked it a thousand times in minor ways. Yeah, weddings are pretty important to like Bengali books, I feel. Um, I always say like Bengali culture is basically just weddings and food, like that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next question is from uh, Satya Achia. Um, hi, Satya. Um, if you had to choose your favorite character in your novel, who would it be and why? Hi, Satya. I love Satya too. So thank you so much for coming, Satya. Um, Honestly, it's hard because I think I in this book, I didn't want to have a villain. And 
I'll let readers decide if I succeed in that. I think most will agree with me that I did, but I didn't really want anyone to feel vilified in the story. I just wanted to show that there are so many different experiences and everyone is kind of the hero in their own head, even when they're making mistakes. Um, so I, I ended up loving basically all the characters. Um, so yeah, I'm going to choose the easy answer and just say I love Zara the most. And I think that she is the most important person in the story to me. So even though there is a love triangle, I'm not team Haroon or team Naeem, I'm team Zara. And Zara, you know, um, having agency and making the best decision for herself and her life. Um, I think she's a really strong character that uh, I'm glad to see a lot of people identify with. Um, she's who I wished I was at that age. Uh, because even though she is still struggling with a lot of the uh, things that are happening in her life, she manages to navigate that with a lot more grace than I did at the time. I was more like Haroon and I was anxious and I was quiet and I didn't always speak up for myself, um, whether it was within family situations or outside. Um, <clears throat> and I, uh, I had a lot of self-hate uh, related to my Bangladeshi identity that I didn't want Zara to have. I wanted it very much to be a love story, a, lo a love letter to being Bangladeshi so that Bangladeshi teens now can actually have that representation and know it's okay to be what they are. So I hope that that's what she'll be for people. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's really difficult like when you're a teenager and specifically when you're like a brown teenager um, who doesn't have a lot of representation um, to be able to stand up for yourself and to like feel like you have a voice in the world. Um, so I definitely think, you know, she's really important representation to show brown girls that you can be that. Um, okay, so um, the next question is from Swati. Um, she asks, well, first of all, she says, congrats. Um, and then she says, um, as a fellow South Asian author, I would love to know if there's any advice you'd have for BIPOC or especially South Asian authors who are debuting in the next few years. Um, and how has your publishing experience been overall? Swati, hi, I think I saw in your message that it was like very early. So thank you so much for, for being here that early. I know that I would struggle to do it. Um, it's and I know Adiba can, can speak to this as well. It's really difficult sometimes being an author of color in this industry at all. If you've look at, looked at some of those statistics that have come out, they've only gotten more and more narrow. So there was this small boom for a while where everyone was saying, we need diverse books and we need to, to back these authors and whatever else may be the case. And that slowly started to go down again. Um, so that is something that's a little bit concerning. And I think um, until publishing as a whole has more diverse gatekeepers, that can't really change because it's not just a matter of the authors, but it's the people who are around them. For example, I mentioned a little bit earlier that I had a copy editor who made me quite uncomfortable sometimes with some of the things that were said um, about my book. And because I have um, you know, with my agent is a woman of color, my editor is a woman of color. Um, they they were able to handle that situation deftly and and uh, support me. Uh, and I know that that's not always a given. Uh, we can't control who we sell to or even if we sell. It's very difficult as an author of color. So I would say um, one piece of advice is um, always assume that you are your biggest supporter because it's probably true. Um, so do what you can uh, for, for your book. Do what you can to find your community um, of supporters, um, not just your readers, but your supporters who keep you going. For example, Adiba was one of those supporters for me for a long time. Um, so find your community, number one. Uh, and then the second thing is, please never beat yourself up for anything that you know you, you wanted to happen, but didn't um, because publishing is just so arbitrary and we are already um, put in a difficult position as authors of color, as marginalized authors, where nothing is in our control. And you often learn that very fast uh, once you, you enter into a publishing landscape where you can't really assume anything. Um, so yeah, just do your best to, to build the community that you have around you. Um, contact booksellers or librarians and whomever else on your own 
I would say that was a big thing for me. I am a former teacher, but I'm just going to give you guys a little hack if you're not a former teacher. Schools, libraries, all of the booksellers, these people are really, really excited to, to get to know you. And especially if you are, um, you know, local to them or you're writing something that they can connect to, even if you're not local to them, you can say, for example, I wrote a book that has a lot of South Asian characters. I know that you teach in an area that is, you know, heavily South Asian. Would you possibly have any interest in doing a virtual event with me or, or doing this with me or doing that with me? And I, basically every time I reached out, sometimes I've been ghosted, but almost every time I've reached out, I got a positive response. Um, so, so yeah, I would say never beat yourself up because it's not your fault, um, but try to find your community as well. That's really good advice. Yeah. And I, I would second like everything you said. I think um, finding your community, especially like it's really important to just keep going, you know, in in publishing, which is a very difficult thing to do when you're um, a, a writer of color. Um, <clears throat> so um, another question here, um, which I think it's a it's a really great question. And I also really want you to talk about it um, is what's the significance of the New Jersey setting for this story? Uh, so I mentioned in my bio that I am like a lifelong New Jersey resident. Um, so I'm born and raised in New Jersey and I know New Jersey gets a bad rap. We are always the butt of all the, the jokes, like, especially when a show is set in New York. Um, but growing up in New Jersey, particularly in Patterson, it was a journey to come to love the place that I was from. Because as I mentioned, um, I had a lot of insecurities about my identity as a teen. Um, so for me, it was a, a huge journey of self-love to come to the point where I wrote a book set in my hometown of Patterson, New Jersey, that has such a big Bangladeshi diaspora population and is so focused on the culture. When I was growing up, the media that was popular was stuff like Gilmore Girls. And so I always wanted to live in a place like Stars Hollow, even though it was like 99% white. Um, and I thought that that was impossible for someone like me. So I hope that readers are able to read about a place like Patterson that honestly gets a, a bad rap despite its like rich cultural history and the very tasty food you can find there. Um, and uh, they come to see their home as something that can be appreciated for its beauty, regardless of what else might be said about it. Yeah, I think that's like, that's really important, especially because we do see like, um, a lot of um, people of color, they tend to live in, you know, more like populated areas, more um, city areas. Um, so it's really important for them to like, not just romanticize the whole stars hollow aesthetic, though, I, I also think, you know, we deserve that too. Um, but, you know, if we were Rory Gilmore, I think we would have a very different experience of Stars Hollow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so another question um, is from Jen. Hi, Jen. Um, so how important was it for you to highlight the differences in generations when it came to writing the diaspora experience and how it changes the tiger slash strict parent trope? Uh, so I had, uh, oh, first let me say, I love Jen as well. Jen also gave me a blurb for The Love Mat. So let me just shout out Jennifer Yen's rom-coms are super cute and they're also Austin retellings. Um, but okay, moving back to the question. I had a chance to discuss it a little bit earlier, um, but I think that we have seen a lot of one-dimensional Asian parent representations in Western media in particular, and that's only recently changing. Um, where you get kind of a sympathetic glimpse into uh, the motivations of these parents. I wanted to write uh, Zara's mom as a very nuanced person who is neither right all the time, nor someone who's a complete villain, because I think that it's so frequent to get one or the other, where sometimes um, creators will like counteract it completely by saying, oh, you know, the mom is always right for, you know, forcing their kid to go to medical school or whatever might be the case, even though they get grossed out seeing guts. The mom was right. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to also be a journey for Zara's mom uh, to come to understand her just like Zara has to come to understand her mom. I think you did a really good job with that. Um, sorry, just trying to find... 
a question that hasn't already been answered. Um, okay, you kind of answered this. I don't, I want to see if you're going to answer it or if you're going to say something that I think you're going to say. Um, it's also from Swati. Um, which of the two love interests would you pick if you are in Zara's place? Um, That's a really difficult question. That is a really difficult question. Honestly, I don't even know if I can answer the question without uh, giving too much of the story away. I don't know. I'm old, so I think I would make <laughs> a decision that's motivated by different things than a teenage girl necessarily would. Um, I don't know. I I love both boys, but I'm not sure if I am ready for like a free spirit musician to sweep into my life. And <laughs> how about we alter the question a little? Which of the characters from the love match, any characters, do you think you'd be friends with? I think definitely Zara would be an easy friend, and then da Zara's uh, friend. Donnie as well. Uh, the two of us love puns. Uh, Donnie comes up with all the punny names for the tea shop chai ho. So I think that I would laugh at all her jokes. Um, yeah, I think I could be friends with her entire friend group because they're just uh, such great characters. And I think I'd be scared of Naeem, honestly, in the sense of like, like oh my, similar to an issue where like, what's up with this boy? And why is he so like, What's up with all this charisma? What's going on? Um, and I'm not sure if I would immediately see past Haroon's um, broodiness. So if he was like cold to me in the beginning, I don't know if I would push past that. I think I, just, I would like Zara in the beginning, if it was up to her, um, she would have like completely shut him out because he's so aloof. I think I would have done the same thing. Yeah, I think I would actually be the same as you as well, where I would I would see like Zara and her entire friend group and I'd be like, oh, look at these like cool brown girls. I would be friends with them. Um, and they're like hang out at like the tea shop and I would go there and like be like, I want to hang out at the tea shop with you guys. Um, but with Naeem, I'd be like, what the heck is going on? And with <laughs> um, um, with Harun, I feel like I would just I would just be really turned off. I'd be like, why are you behaving this way? I don't want to get to know you at all, actually. Um, OK, I think. We're probably at our last question because I know we're coming to the end of the hour. Um, so just to you know finish us off, this is a great question, I think, for that is um it's from an anonymous attendee. Um, what is book two about? Can you tease something about it? Okay, so if you follow me on socials at all, you know that I got to announce my adult debuts. So I can tell you a little bit about that. I'm not actually sure which one's going to come first at this point, um, but my adult debut is very different from The Love Match in some ways while also being similar. Um, it follows uh, a young woman who, um, in the wake of her mother's passing, um, after living with her, a single mother her whole life, um, discovers that her father is still alive and not only alive, but that he has an entire family uh, living in Mumbai and also discovers that he is incredibly wealthy and his family is currently in the midst of a succession war um, for his company. Uh, so there's a lot of sibling ri rivalry and complex sibling relationships. Um, so I, I got to explore family in a different way, but I love writing about families. So, uh, so that was interesting. And then there's also a bit of a love triangle in that one. Um, although I wouldn't say necessarily it's like outright a romance. It's more of a woman's fiction novel with romantic elements. Uh, but the heroine meets two complicated men uh, during her trip and kind of has to figure out what their motivations are because when you find out that you might be uh, one of the heiresses to a large fortune, sometimes the people who come into your life might be um, might be there with ulterior motives. So, so that's what um, the adult book is about. And I'm also writing another YA rom-com uh, that I think the fans of The Love Match will enjoy, but it's also a little bit different. Nothing, nothing more you can give us about the second, second way. <laughs> it also deals with tea. And this one has enemies to lovers in a bigger scale. I'll just say that. Okay. 
Okay, we'll take it. We'll take it. Sounds both of them sound really good. And I've I read a little bit of your second um uh, your second book, your adult, and it's really, really good. So um you guys should get excited for it. Yes. And let me just add to that. I want to do uh, a bit of a, a release day giveaway for the, uh, the kind people who are here. So first of all, I want to support the bookshop. Um, I'm going to be putting a Google form that hopefully works. I just threw it together last minute. Things have been chaotic. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, but if, here's a Google form. If you put your name and email there, I am going to be choosing one winner um, international, since the bookshop ships internationally, to win either a copy of Honey and Ishu's Guide to Fake Dating or the Love Match from East City, uh, East City Bookshop. Um, and uh, I'm going to be choosing another winner, um, unfortunately, US only, to give away um, my copies of Honey and Ishu and uh, the Love Match. So that there will be two winners total. Please go ahead and fill out the form if you're interested in that. Um, and I'm just so grateful for the lovely folks at East City Bookshop for having us. We are so glad to have had you. This was phenomenal. Um, I love hearing the discussion of everything. Um, and the two of you together is wonderful. So thank you both for being with us. And thank you for everyone uh, who came tonight. Don't forget to fill out that Google form. And um, if you want to purchase copies, we have um, copies of Love Match and all of Adiba's books at the shop. And we also have signed book plates for the Love Match. So you can order through us and we would be happy to ship anywhere in the world. Um, so thank you everyone for being here tonight and uh, we will see you the next time. Yes, thank you so <laughs> thank much. You so much. Everyone came. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone.